And at the end, remind me like to type M. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. All right. Hi, everyone. I um, Should I be sharing my screen for this? Would that As work? You like? Yeah. All right. I think it should be. You can, you, everyone can share, I think. Yeah. All right. So I am happy and nervous to go first. And then hopefully um, we can learn about this chapter together and you guys can give me some feedback about how this worked. Um, this is my first time actually doing a more formal book club. So uh, I kind of treated this as uh, I want to teach you guys about this chapter and, and hopefully that works out well. Um, I was really excited to pick this chapter. I have read it before in theory, but uh, reading it again this time, I realized I really didn't absorb most of what we talked about. So the purpose of this chapter is really to be able to kind of understand that there's a difference between an object's name and, and the object or the value itself. And the reason why we want to know this is because it actually has some pretty crazy implications for um, how fast your code runs and the memory it uses. There was a couple of places in this chapter where I was just like, my mind was blown. I was like, what, really? Um, so I thought that was really kind of cool. Um, and then also we're using some of the functional programming tools as we were kind of looking through this. Now, uh, Olivier, one thing I wasn't really sure about is like, is would this be norm, would I normally go through the quizzes and the answers and things like that or? You are free to do um, everything you want. If some uh, uh, like, yeah. It I usually do not go uh, on every question quiz. I usually highlight the one that I think tough. And then if other people like want to share one that they misunderstood, uh, I think everyone like can ask. Okay. Sounds so good. feel free to do yeah, as you as you expect, or like if one like co caught you by uh, yeah, do do as needed. It works. No, yeah. no particular okay. rules. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, then maybe with the quiz, the one I'll talk about was the one that I thought like you didn't really learn a little bit about during the chapter. And it's one that I always find kind of tricky um, is this idea of you can technically have names for objects and co or columns, I should say, and objects um, that are like non-semantic names. So you can technically have like one numbers be the name of a column, but it gets like really messy if you're trying to reference that column. And so um, you can use the back ticks in this example here um, if you have columns called one and two. And this is, in my experience, only useful if you're loading in data and you don't want it to fix the names um, and then you need to reference those names. But ideally, you, you get rid of them as fast as possible so you don't have to deal with them. Um, yeah, so that was just like a little note that I, I thought I, I always find that kind of catches me by surprise sometimes when I'm working with that kind of stuff. So the first thing we learn about in this chapter is this idea of binding. And it's the idea that whenever we sort of create or assign uh, values to, to a name, we, we really have two things. We have the name and then we have the values. And we can use um, this function, the object address function, to kind of pull out like a kind of a, a, a name, a, an address, I guess, or, you know, an ID associated with the values of an object independent of its name. And that can be really useful if you're trying to see what, sort of what's going on under the hood with these values. One thing I thought was, I think the first time I read this chapter was kind of like really caught me by surprise was that you, it's kind of how almost efficient R is and that, you know, you can have multiple names that refer to the same value so that you have um, you're not really duplicating stuff in R's memory until you really need to. <clears throat> um, so I think I'll go through that first exercise here because I thought it was kind of useful to think about. It was essentially just as asking us to explain the relationships amongst these sort of four values. And we really have only two values and four names. And so we have A, B, which is points to the same value as A, C, which points to the same value as A and B. And then we have D, which although it is the same values from like an R perspective or from a user perspective, they're not the same. I, they don't have the same ID. So we actually have two sets of one to 10 values um, here, which um, 
I always find is like, there's almost like two ways of thinking about it in your head. Did anyone have anything that they thought? Does that make sense everyone? Or did anyone have any questions about that or discussions? All right. I wanted to make one quick point um, that, you know, going, going through this book after working with computers for a while, right? Like you struggle with computers for the first couple years and, you know, maybe somebody introduces you to like a C++ course, right? And, you know, you try and open it up and you run something and it breaks and you just see like these hexadecimal things all over your screen. Um, one thing that I enjoyed about this first chapter was that it gives us the lobster package, which shows us like, okay, it's just, it's just a, it's just a block in memory. You don't have to be like so overwhelmed when you see your computer C lang or clang, whatever you want to call it, just going bananas. You know, <laughs> it's just a block in memory. It's not that scary. That's a really cool idea. It's funny. I don't think I actually made that connection myself because as soon as you called it a block of memory, I'm like, oh yeah, that is what it is. But I didn't really, I didn't make that ref connection until you mentioned that. Uh, no, that's a good observation. Um. Okay, so that's the idea behind the binding basics. And so we can now apply kind of these ideas and learn a little bit more about how R uses it and how it kind of imp impacts the um, kind of the speed and the amount of memory use. So R has two kinds of ways of changing values. One is the copy on modify and the second one is modify in place. And so if you have, um, a value that has multiple names and you modify one of those, then you're going to get a copy of that value and it's going to be modified. If you have only a single value and a single name and you change the value, then it's just going to be modified in place. And that makes sense because why would you copy it if you don't need to reference it anywhere else? So we can also, uh, at this point, we learned about the trace mem uh, function and we can use that to kind of trace what's going on. So this is one of these examples where we have our, our original um, uh, object, uh, our name, x, and our values, uh, vector of one, two, three. And we can trace it where we can copy it into y. And that actually doesn't, and I shouldn't say copy because it doesn't copy. We just create another reference to that value. So now we have x and y. They're both pointing to the same value. And then if we are going to change the part of that vector, um, now we are making y different from x. And so what happens is that value actually is copied, separated, and we modify it. And so now we actually have this reference that the trace memory has been um, copied. And now we have two values and two names pointing to those values. Um, now if we modify y again, nothing happens. We don't have any uh, reference to trace mem because it's already been copied and we only have one of that. And so it's just being modified in place. Someone put their hand up. Joe. Um, yeah, I put my hand up, sorry. So no, go for it. This, this like confused me for a minute because they're doing two things here and it was hard for me to wrap my head around. One of the things they were doing was changing the um, the type of, of object or whatever in the vector. So they went from like, you know, one, two, three, which are coded as decimals to four L, which is an integer uh, a format. And so it took me a while to figure out, like, I thought what was happening with the copy on modify was that it would, because it didn't change when you went from four L to five L, I was like, oh, this has something to do with the type of object it is, right? Because it changed when it went from three as a decimal to four L as an integer, but it didn't change when it went from four L as an integer to five L, but that actually has nothing to do with it. Right. It as far as actually, it, um, it, it's either, it's like any kind of change. Um, yeah, that's but it would, have, really... it would have been easier for me if they had just made Y three, the, the third entry in Y to be four. Yes, I think you're right. And it's, I thought it was actually really interesting because in one of the exercises, I, I had no idea why there was a problem. And it was because it was an integer change. It's because they changed it from a double to an integer. And I did not pick up on that at all. So when I saw this code initially, you you were much more precise than I was. When I saw it, I just thought, oh yeah, they turned the three to a four. So that's that's the change. But it's actually both. They did two changes in here. They changed the three to a four, but they also changed the type of vector from a double to an integer. And so in either case, I think if we ran this either way, it would be, we would get a new 
we would get a new value because we've changed both the type and the val values itself. Yeah, that's right. Because if I, because I've run it, you know, if you just change it to four instead of four L, then it does exactly the same thing as what happens here. Yeah. And then, yeah. So the key point here is that we've changed something. So it's not the same value anymore. Um, and then this case, although we've changed something, it's point, it only has one name, this value, this new value only has one name. So we're modifying it in place because it doesn't need to copy it. Uh, one thing I also found personally um, easier was using ref. I think trace mem for some reason, it worked, but I actually found it easier to use the reference that, pu that pulls out that, that memory block ID every time sort of afterwards. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd share that that kind of worked better for me and the way my brain works. So one thing that was kind of interesting is that even if you are um, modifying things kind of within a function, it still applies the same logic. Um, so in this little example here, if we kind of have a function that just kind of spits out A, if you give it A, it gives you A back. Um, and we run, we create Z with this, sorry, Canadian Z. Um, so if we run, we create this new uh, name Z that then points to the value of X, even though it goes through a function, it's still not creating a new value. It's now we have X and we have Z that are now both pointing to the same value, even though we kind of use the function to create that. Um, and I did this, I confirmed this in my head by using the ref function. So you can see that the reference, the IDs for both of these um, uh, names is the same. Does that make sense? I feel like for me, actually, this was like one of the weirdest parts for me is understanding what they meant by it passing through the function. <clears throat> so lists got a little bit more interesting. Um, because I found that, um, well, yeah, they're complicated. <laughs> so uh, what we know for lists is that they, uh, they have elements inside of a list and each element is pointing to values, um, but the list itself has its own ID. So when we use the reference, so I'm just gonna jump down here. If we use the reference to sort of look at a list, that first top ID there, it's sort of the overall ID for a list. And so I found that with some of these examples, especially when you had lists nested within lists, I had a hard time kind of tracing those IDs until I realized that we have an ID for the list and then an ID for every element in a list. So for example, this list here with three elements will have four IDs, one for the list and one for each of its sub elements. And one thing that's very cool is that um, the lists don't actually store the elements themselves. They store the references to those values. And as of R3.1.0, it only creates a shallow copy. So it only really copies whichever kind of sub element needs to be updated. Um, and that must have created, so, I mean, I'm trying to think if I, I'm pretty sure I was using R at that time. So I'm kind of trying to think if I knew if I recognize that change. Um, I do remember being told that like loops were really terrible um, and then all of a sudden they got better. So I wonder if this is maybe one of the ways in which they did get better with the, the lists becoming shallow copies. <clears throat> so uh, for example, if we look at these two lists, we have L1, it's just a list with three elements, three uh, numbers, we caught, I shouldn't say copy again. We create another reference to that list. So we have L1 and L2, which are now referencing the same list. And we modify the third element. What we can see is we, if we use the ref um, function to kind of compare those lists, they each have their unique IDs. So each list is not referencing the same object anymore. But the first two elements in each list, so this one here and this one here are the same. And that's because they haven't been modified. So they're still pointing to the same value. And in this figure here that you can see that by these two on um, L1, one and two are still pointing to the same values. It's the third one here that um, is now different between these two lists. And so the first one still points to that third value. And this one's now pointing to the new fourth value.
um, data frames are sort of lists of vectors. And in my head, I always knew that data frames were, were lists, but I don't think I really thought about it in the sense of how that makes a difference with columns versus rows. So in a data frame, if you copy and modify a column, um, you, you actually only copy and modify that particular column. But the kicker is if you modify a row, you have to then copy and modify every single column in a data frame. And it's funny because I think when I think of data frames, I think of like, you know, the sort of the vectorizing where you can do a lot of things row by row. And I, I guess I think this is perhaps, or sorry, not row by row, but column by column. And I wonder if this is one of those ideas of why that works so well. Um, and so in this example here, if we modify our column, we can see that um, this uh, here is the column that has changed. The first two columns are still the same. But in this case, if we're modifying a row, we've changed every single column. And so we've actually, you know, essentially doubled the amount of memory we're taking. Um, I've definitely worked on projects that had serious bottleneck issues. And, and so now I feel like I have to go back and, and redo them all now, um, thinking about things differently. Um, another new thing for me was this idea that character vectors have, like that there's a global string pool in R that all the character vectors that we create just keep pointing to this uh, pool. So if you create a vector with multiple characters that are the same, so that you have like a A and A, they're actually just referring both to the same um, character. Can I ask about this too? Yeah, let's see. What does the global finish. string pool mean? It can't possibly mean every string that can ever exist, you know, because that would be infinitely big. I think it means every string that exists in your session, but I, I mm. would welcome what other people seem to think I thought in your session, but um, I, it, to me, it is, I had made the assumption that it's like every string that you are creating in your session gets added to that pool, but um, okay. cause I, I couldn't imagine anything else. It, like that you said, it sense. wouldn't make any sense, right. but um, any other thoughts? No, I, I think it feels good to try it. Like you need to allocate memory first. I mean, you need to uh, create it for it to be, to the memory to be allocated first. I don't think R allocate, pre-allocate memory for a random string. No. That's when you create insane. like your vector A, 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 B, C, D. I think you will yeah. allocate the memory for it and then point to it. But yeah. if you, for example, like you have no J here, Oh no, you have, sorry. Uh, I mean, no, they are not. Oh no, they are here. I don't there's know. No Z, there's no Z. Yeah, there's no Z, but like uh, the global string pool comport a J, which is not on the A, 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 B, C, D uh, stuff. No. I don't know. I think it, like, yeah. it also can't, there's an infinite number of springs. I mean, not technically infinite, but like effectively infinite number of strings. You're just limited by how long they can be. I think it's, you hit a, a wall at some point, but it's like effectively infinite. So there's no way, yeah, like you said, there's just no way right. that it's right. pre-allocated. That session thing makes sense to me too. So I'm going to go with that. <laughs> I mean, I figured it's my working hypothesis. <laughs> so um, I'll highlight this one exercise because we were kind of talking about that. This one really threw me for a loop. I, I did have to go back and double check a lot of my answers with um, the solutions book, just, you know, because sometimes I wasn't at all sure if I'd miss if I'd understood. Um, and this one in particular, uh, you know, Joe, like you were mentioning, when I ran through it the first time, I had no idea. Um, uh, or sorry, um, I, I assumed it was simply because we made the value uh, a four. And when I looked at the answer, that's when I realized that it actually matters that you've changed from integer. And I have to admit, like, I'm pretty bad about remembering. I do recognize that, uh, and I, actually, I should have mentioned this earlier. If anyone didn't know, the L means, it's kind of like a short form for saying, this is a one and it's an integer one. Otherwise, the default is that it's a double, which means it could have decimals. Um, and I, I know that in theory, but I'm really bad about remembering kind of what that means and that I, I tend to just use like, whole, you know, just regular numbers without the L all the time. Um, yeah, so this was one where I had to remember or realize, I suppose, that when you change from integer to a double, you're actually changing some pretty big things under the hood. 
And that might, you know, if you're working with a really kind of crazy workflow, that might actually have some pretty big consequences. Um, this one was a little crazy because this was like recursive or, you know, like nested lists. And I think it was also for me the first example of where you uh, sort of move the binding of a value. So in this exercise, we have a list of the values one through 10, and we're, we're giving it, we're assigning it the name X. And then we assign a sub list in X to be X. And it seems extremely, you know, circular. Um, and so what we have, and so the question was like, well, what's happening here? And this is from the answers, I believe. So I pulled that in to kind of help illustrate, but I was using the ref to kind of help me. And so the way to think of this is, okay, well, you have X is still a list. Um, and when we are assigning X to like a sub element in X, we're creating a new list. Um, we're not creating a new list, but we're adding that list in there. And that is referencing this original value here. It's not referencing X anymore because, sorry, X has now actually changed the binding. So now the binding for X is the, um, is, X now has a new binding and this original value here is bound to both the first element in that list so that it ends in 918 and the sort of sub <laughs> element of that new nested list. And so that's where this thing got a little messy for me in my head. So remember that we actually have um, really only two values here, but we also have two lists. So X is a list. This is the reference or the, you know, the ID for that list that we call X. Its first element is this original vector of one through 10. And that I'm just going to call it 918. That's what it ends with. Now we actually have a second element, which is itself a list. And so that second element also has its own ID kind of referencing it as a list. And then inside that list is again, this vector, which is still pointing to that same value uh, uh, one through 10. So we have, you can think of it, I guess we have three values. One is the original one, the integer list. And then we have sort of two lists that are nested within each other. So this one like really made my brain hurt. So does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. I, I would love to talk about this problem more because this was the problem. This was the exercise in the whole chapter that I spent the most time kind of thinking about. So I just put in the um in the chat as a screenshot of what X is. So I don't know if you have the ability to pull up yes. your chat. Um, and I don't understand that second component. So I would love to, if anybody could kind of walk me through that in terms of the double brackets. So I'll tell you what I understand. So X is a list of lists, I get that. The first item in the list, which is denoted by double bracket one, is that vector one through 10. Yeah. The second item in the list, which is now denoted by double bracket two, is also a list. But what yes. I'm really confused by is why there's now a double bracket two and a double bracket one. Like that, I just have no idea what's going on there. So I can give a, a what I think is going on and I would love anyone else to chime in. So I agree that I find that that double, double kind of uh, notation underneath a little- confused. Actually double, triple yeah. <laughs> or triple, double so, or whatever. So what I think it, how I think of it in my head is that we have this, okay, the first double, double bracket to double bracket says, this is a second element in a list. Got it. Underneath yeah. that, we see, okay, this is a list. Um, it is the second element in this current list. And its first element, list element, is now, and you go down one line, and then you get the vector first. That's how I read of it, read it. You've got a second element, it is a second element, and its first element is this vector. I don't know if that's accurate. That's how I think of it. It does seem repetitive to me, um, but I think that's somewhat how it works. Um, sorry, let me, I can, um, what we can do to kind of explore that a little bit. Yeah, I was opening a new session, but you are doing it also, that's perfect. Sorry? 
Yeah, that's good to open an session. I was I was opening an, an a one and typing also slowly, but that's that's good that you are doing it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we had one through ten. Let's see here, and then go I'm, I'm gonna do my pronostic before, but I could be wrong. So that's so that you know, like I can be wrong. I think the double bracket one on the second element is just the name of the list. Yes. I agree. But, yes. Uh, and I, I agree it's 100 person com <laughs> it's some, but let's see it let, let's test that. Yeah, let's test that. Um I'm a, I can't even remember what we wrote so I'm going to pull this up. <laughs> um all right, so if we can everyone see my screen is it yeah. um big enough? Yeah, uh, the font size. Okay. So we've got a list, we've got a list and I'm going to look at that list. Um all right, and so these are the problems we are having here. One thing I was also thinking that might help us is if we added in a third one. Oh, Ooh. yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, I'm actually not going to do that crazy a, a thing, though. I'm actually going to do, uh, we're going to add in a third one. It's just going to be its own sub list. I didn't want to list the sub, 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 sub. I think that might get a little nuts. But yeah. mm -hmm. now we get X, we can see that, yeah, so this, we got the second, second, third, third. Now we can also try naming them so we can say names x is equal to um, first second third and if we look at x we get our name so these are the names but i think I the double bracket one is because the first list x has uh, a name of uh, double bracket one if right, you, right. If you if you rerun it, rerun it, and just ask name X to see what it does. What's what's the name do we have here? Uh, one second here. What if I said? Does other people have ideas? We can ask after later also, on forum. So, oops. Um... Yeah, it's a bit too far. You're out of bounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. One second. Set. I might get a little nuts here. Um, no, no, that's so. great. Yeah, well, that's funny because everyone does stuff very differently. <laughs> and see here, like the it's X. Oh, you went. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'm doing this. No, that's that's good. And uh, if you if you print uh, Y. Yeah. No. No. Right. So I added it to the wrong. That's just naming the vector. That's not naming. Yeah. But so if you check case. if you check why uh, the first element is named one by default, no. That like, is just... so I could just name names why, yeah. right? Sorry guys, thanks. Just no just worries. run that. Don't, so don't assign it. Don't assign it. Just run it. Just yeah, just run it so we can confirm it. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Just run that. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't uh, have a name. So by default, the name is like the it, it, it displays the first index, but yeah. name it no. And you went to you you, you go to see uh, no it's Apple. Now it's Apple, yeah. Yeah. So that's where that one comes. That one is the is and I think that and, makes that applies to vectors too, right? It's either got a name like A or it's got um the index in this case one, and here it's either got you know the name Apple or the index one. So it thing, really is just about that redundancy. That one, one, two, two, three, three is really just a redundant. I, I, yeah, it's funny. I do find it redundant too. Yeah. And but we I, should check it. It's also our print work. Sorry. It could be like uh, our print uh, return the list. Because like when you ask, uh, well, you can print X, but when you are you you do X, you are printing X, so you are calling the function print. And yeah. maybe the function print do something on all you present a uh, list without name and it displays the index. I have no idea how it works. It's just an hypothesis. Yeah. So I think for me, I I just kind of view that as it's it's a duplication, or maybe it's more that this is trying to be really explicit here, that this is, you know, so if we had No, I think I think he used the he used the name, the named list. And with no named list, he used the index. No, it's just a duplication, yeah. 
have we, does anyone else want me to look at something um, or have we explored this? There is something that yeah. helped me sometimes to follow this list underneath list. So instead of printing them the way that you are doing, if you go to your environment to the right, to the upper part, and you click on the blue arrows, yeah. it helps me better to see the nested nature of how they are. Yeah, that's all maybe it's just me, but maybe maybe someone else can get some help doing it that way. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And that um you can also see that if you use the str function, that's like structure. Um okay. function you know. <laughs> always forget about, but it's it really is uh, it's the same thing here. It, it's funny. I, I know people who use str all the time and I never think of it. Um, but that's a really good reminder, yeah, because you can see it tells you exactly we got a list, we got a list of two elements, list of one. Yeah. And the thing is that I was confused at the beginning because I thought that when you created the very first list, you create the list, and then I thought that you were adding X that we would like that the new list or the X list will substitute the second element, like the number two on the first list. So I was really confused about that. <laughs> Yeah, I find lists I need to think about because they often are a little, um, just for me, it's always about what level of the list am I trying to access? Is everyone sort of satisfied with that? Should we? Um... Perfect, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, yeah. No, really... yeah, 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 great job. I think we can ask to have more feedback on the forum, you know? and and see what other people smarter than us who have made that like it's a small challenge that i think people will enjoy yeah no i think so yeah and every 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 better understanding is a good understanding yeah exactly <laughs> even smaller that was great thanks a lot and thanks yeah. for like life coding it's always like difficult to do it is fun though i do yeah, no, I know. It's always a little unnerving. Cause I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. And you're, you know, but it is, um, it is useful and it's fun to do it with, um, with all of you guys. Yeah, no, it's, it's always like difficult. So, yeah. All right. Should I, um, continue on with object sizes? Yes. All right. So, uh, here we're going to use the object size function from the lobster package. Um, one thing, um, that's, kind of interesting is that, you know, it's that I, I kind of like, I, I almost, I think I almost quoted this here. It's like, it's pretty much difficult. Like you can't really predict how big thing, things are going to be because you're not really sure, you know, necessarily of all the references and all the copies. And that actually gets into the next section where it's like, it's really hard sometimes to predict when an object is going to be copied. Um, so you can use the object size function to uh, figure out how big an object is. We also have um, alternative representations, they call alt rep, that apparently is also a kind of relatively new-ish thing added to R. Um, and that I think it's probably more complicated than they just explained, but it, it just kind of means that some things like if you said, you know, one colon a thousand, and I should apologize, that should be a thousand values, is not, you know, a thousand values in your memory. It's actually just one and 1000 because R can kind of like understand that, that it doesn't need to kind of create them until you're going to use them. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, one question in the, uh, in the exercises that I thought was like a bit of a funny question. They're like, why is it misleading to look at the size of like the functions mean SD and VAR? And their answer was because why would you care? And I, I thought that was like almost like a trick question a little bit. Um, the idea they were saying is like, these are functions from base R and, and stats package, which are always loaded by default. You cannot remove them. So why would you ever care how much um, memory is being used by them? And I, I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but um, I thought it was a, a useful thing to remember that, you know, usually when we're thinking about memory, and sizes and things like that. It's, it's from a more pr practical standpoint for sort of, you might look at it out of curiosity, but it, there's not much you can do with it. So, um, yeah. I mean, people, and pe uh, Python people care because like you can import specific namespace to your environment. You don't need to load all the function. Well, not with these ones though. These ones you yeah, don't Yeah, no, not with the base R one. Yeah, one hundred. Yeah. If you're loading a base R, you, you have all the base R stuff, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Although maybe you could make an argument for being like, oh, some of these functions in the stats package are just too big. You know, don't make me load them by default, but I think that would be a hard sell. Yeah. I mean, it, it's also something important for like runtime, right? So when we then begin to start developing our own packages, um, you know, you wouldn't want there to be a scenario where your package happens to take four or five seconds to load just because it's really big. Yeah. Oh, and that, yeah, that's a definite um, thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I'm getting lost in thought of all the problems I've had with things like that. Um, and I'm very poor at uh, fixing them. Um, I usually just assume people's computers are fast enough to handle it, which is not ideal. So I think I'll leave this last uh, predict the sizes one. I thought that one was a bit interesting too, but maybe we'll we'll come back to it at the end if if we want to chat about that, unless someone really wants to talk about it now. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about these. We had these. Um, we have values that are bound to names, and we know that when we change when we have it bound to more than one name and we change the value associated with one of those names we get a copy in place and when we have a value that um and that is sorry let me rephrase it and so that is normal so normally what happens when you change a value that kind of exists you're going to create a new copy um and you you have a copy in place system however sometimes you um, actually modify the value in place. And there's two sort of main places in which you would do this. One is that you would have an object that has a single binding. So you you have a value of uh, the vector one through 10 and you assign it to the, you bind it to the name X and then you, you change that vector to be like one through hundred. And you will actually just modify that value in place because there's no other value bound, sorry, there's no other name bound to that value. So that's an optimization, a performance optimization that R does. Um, there's also environments. So environments are um, special <laughs> in R. I'm not even sure I could really define an environment for you. I guess I always think about environments where everything's happening right now. Um, and that could be inside of a function where everything's happening or in your session where everything's happening and they are they are kind of like nested as well. And so you can, this is getting to definitely the edge of anything I've ever done, um, but you can, you know, assign an environment to uh, a name. To, you can bind an environment to a name, um, but you, uh, you will never copy that. You will modify it in place. So let's talk a little bit more about objects with a single binding. Um, like I mentioned, it's really hard to know if a copy is going to happen. Um, and it gets a little tricky because if you, R doesn't really understand um, more than uh, one amount of binding, sorry, more than one bind binding. So R understands that there's, I think, no bindings, one binding, or two or more bindings. Um, I don't know. Is anyone a Terry Pratchett fan? There, I felt like there was a Terry Pratchett reference to the trolls in here with like one, two, lots, many, something like that. Anyway, um, so you can have like say you have like three or four bindings names bound to a value. You could you know get rid of all of those and have just one left over. Um, but R won't know. R will always still copy that because it won't understand that you've gotten rid of everything. As soon as you go over two, I think um, it um, it doesn't get it. So R will occasionally, in certain circumstances, make a copy even if there is um, an exist uh, only one existing binding. Um, also, this was one where I had a little bit of a hard time understanding this in my head. Um, but apparently, functions also make references. Uh, we also make a reference to a function unless it's a C-based function. And so we'll kind of illustrate that, I think, a little bit in this in this little example here. Um, but essentially, the verdict is try not to guess because you won't know. Um, and use trace memory to find out um, what's happening. Um, I did really, I think we have enough time. I'd like to go over this example, at least kind of quickly. Um, this one I thought was kind of nuts because this is where I was just like, what? Because I use data frames so much in all my workflows and I definitely have workflows that are slow. And when I realize how much of a difference that can be simply between using a list versus a data frame, and I'm always thinking of data frames, just lists, right? Um, 
but apparently there are some pretty big performance differences. So this is an example of using the list function versus the data frames function. And it has to come back with this idea that um, list functions are based on C code in, in, in internal C code and database data frames, excuse me, functions are not. And so if we um, set ourselves up with um, a little data set, we've got our X data set, it's a data frame here, and we're creating some medians for this data frame. And we want to trace what happens when we take um, every column in this data frame and subtract the median. So if we trace the memory of what's happening to this data frame X, we can see that in every iteration of the median, we are creating, we are copying and creating a new uh, value every single time. And so over time that can take uh, that, well, that might, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, that might take um, a bit more time than you think it should. If we do the exact same, uh, I should say here, this exact same loop, but first we turn X into a list, which is really easy because data frames are really, every column is just a list. So if you just do as list X, you get then a list of all these uh, columns, which are now lists. And we do the same thing, the same for loop, we get one copy made. And that's like, to me, that just kind of blew my mind of how much of a difference that makes just by switching from one data format to another. I'm going to talk about the benchmark. So this was actually exercise number two, I think at the end of this little section, because they were like, oh, use the benchmark or the bench package to benchmark this function. Um, and so what I, I didn't do it the way they did it in the answers. Um, they did a really, really fancy way in the answers and I just kind of did it a quick and dirty way. Um, but what I did was I put this little for loop into a function with two arguments. So we have D, which is like the data set, whether or not it's a data frame or a list, and then that medians um, uh, list that we're using here. So I created this little function. Um, we've got, I'm just sort of repeating um, what we had before. We have our X, which is our data frame, the medians, which is the medians of this data frame. And um, I think that actually might be incorrect now that I look at it, but it doesn't matter. It still illustrates the point. Um, we have uh, now Y, which is our list. So if we use a benchmark package, so, or sorry, it's bench is the package, but bench calling, the mark is the function. So you can use um, the mark, function from the bench package just by adding colon colon there, if you have it installed. Um, and I said, run it twice uh, and compare a data frame um, example and the list example. So I'm just kind of naming them. And what I wanted it to do is run this, this little function we created median with once with the data frame X and once with the list. And this is, um, with our original five columns here. And if we look at, this is sort of the, the, the output, this gives us the information on kind of how fast things went. So if we look, I usually, when I'm using benchmark, I tend to look at the median right away. And you can see that um, the median speed for the data frame was longer than the, the list. So it did take longer to run um, this function on the data frame than the list. Um, but if we up that to 20 columns, it takes, much longer to run that with a data frame than with a list. Other things you can look at are iterations per second. In this case, you want the reverse. You want um, more iterations per second is faster. And so um, you can see also something that was kind of interesting, I thought, was that even though we had so many more columns of data, the, the list um, time, it did increase, but not by very much. And so, um, yeah, I was excited. So I thought, wow, because to me, I was just like, that's a pretty big change considering how similar data frames and lists are together. Any kind of comments or discussion about that example? Those, that's great. I was I was kind of thinking when you were using an apply, if it converted, if, if at one time you need to convert it to list. And that's why it's faster, because at one time when you use a apply, maybe you are converting part of your data frame to a list. That could explain also the speed up versus, and the for loop maybe does not convert the object. That's a really cool. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I mean, that if we have time at the end, what we should do is do another live coding and and explore and and see if it, if it makes, if you see these same differences, 
with L apply than a for loop. But, you know, I have always been told or I've always heard that L apply does not have the same restrictions, um, speed restrictions as a for loop. So I've always heard that L apply, you should use L apply instead of a for loop. Um, but I, I never really understood why, but that would make sense if that was the case, if L apply just kind of converted to a list first and then ran it, that would make a lot of sense. All right, hey, uh, so Steffi, before you move move on to the next section, I do have a question uh, earlier in 2.5, uh, 2.5.1 in the book is objects with a single binding. This is a really simple example where you're creating a vector V, right, which is just one, two, three, mm -hmm. and then modifying the third element to four. Yeah. And looking at the diagrams in the book, it would suggest that the memory address should be the same post, uh, you know, modification of that vector. But when I try to run this in R, I actually get a new address. So and are you running Studio? I'm running R Studio. So that's the And this is the only, is, is that the problem? That's the problem. Um, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Sorry, that's one thing that like they had this one little line at the beginning that if you run these examples in our studio, you will get a new memory address every single time, no matter what. And it has to do with this environment pane. To be perfectly honest, I didn't understand why, but it had something to do with to show objects in the environment. Um, our studio needs to make them copies. Um, I, I was kind of, in the back of my mind, I wondered if that has performance implications. Um, but what they're saying is that if you run them in a terminal here, so if we uh, if we run that code there, sorry, I feel like I have no brain today. So I'm like, I have to copy everything. Um, oh, and I wanted to do the trace mem. Uh, so I do this and then I do- You are doing great, you are doing great. Thank you. <laughs> And we do trace mem and then we run this, we get a new one, right? And that's what you're saying. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Now let's that's see. That's right. But interestingly enough, throughout the chapter, this was the only example where really? this disconnect happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, from what I understood, it was supposed to happen all the time. But um, I, like I said, I don't really understand exactly how it's going. So maybe it has to do with exactly how it shows up in the um in the environment pane but let's just double check trace. yeah yeah i think i need lobster right is that trace men from lobster no it's not this this one might be base it's it's mem not men thank you there we go all right so if i do that and now i do the v3 assigned to four we don't have a an updated address um, um, so maybe the comment is yeah. more that I'm reliable in our studio as opposed to. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I read the same passage you did and I was very confused by it because I had, like I said, no issues except for this example yeah. uh, where the memory address changes in, in our studio. Uh, you very tried. Good. Thank I, you. I didn't even bother looking into it. So that was um, actually kind of cool that you looked into it and then we could see that it, it doesn't always apply. So. I wonder what exactly our studio is doing. Our studio definitely does a lot more. Um, so this is actually, it's really interesting that, that I didn't pick up on this. There was a question um, in, where was it? Um, I want to say our general or, yeah, there was a question in our general about how to have inline printing when you're working with um, like a quarter document, right? It's like in our studio, you get inline printing pretty like easy whenever you're using a QMD or a .rmp. But with VS Code, for example, you do get the um, the hints and the fancy graphics and everything, but you'd never get inline code, right? So somebody wanted to figure out like, okay, well, you know, why can't I just get inline code? Why is it so difficult? And the reason is that our studio is so tightly coupled to the current running R namespace that in order to get inline printing of results, it has to be, it, it's probably doing what we're seeing here, 
it's probably changing a lot of different memory addresses. Whereas for, for a terminal, VS Code is just saying, is this our language? Okay, cool. I'm just going to send it to a terminal running. I'm going to print whatever comes back. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't. That's good to know. That's good to know. I don't use VS Code, um, but I uh, I think it's always good to understand a little bit how it works. Um, just because maybe one day I do want to use it, or maybe someone has a question. But that's uh, definitely getting out of depth for me. No, but I'm, I'm glad that you pointed this out. It, it makes that whole thread make a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that is useful. Yeah. All right. Does anyone... Um, we want to talk about environments. I think we have two last sections, so um, and then we'll be kind of close to the end. So environments always are tricky, I think. Um, they are always modified in place, and they call that reference semantics. Um, and to me, that guy got a little crazy because um, of things that they pointed out. And I'm hopeful like, that we are going to talk about environments in chapter seven. So maybe some of what we'll learn today will be confusing, but will make more sense later on. Um, so one thing that I thought was kind of cool is if we create an environment here and we call it E1, and then we, you know, what we would normally think of as, oh, sorry, we're not copying. I know this. We're creating another reference E2 to this original environment here. Then let's say we change the the value of C that's in that environment, or you know the the value that C is bound to, if we're being technically correct. Four. The one thing, and we say, okay, so now this is going to be four. Now, in a normal object, we would now have two environments, and one had C bound to a value of three, and one had C bound to a value of four. What's nuts to me though now is if you look at the environment E two C, it, it's four. And so essentially, you can just kind of like automatically update everything by changing it in one place. And that's because these are still referencing the same um, the same value, which in this case is an environment. So when you're referencing an environment for more than one name, you never copy that environment. You are always just modifying it across the board. Um, so that they had this one comment. I, I really just wanted to put it in here because I was like, what? And hopefully it'll make more sense. But apparently environments can contain themselves, which seems, again, a little nuts to me. And they were also saying, and I didn't put it in here, but that the this also means that functions can, what can functions do? Functions can, remember their previous state, which, Again, I feel like it's one of those things that until you need to use it, you probably didn't really understand it. But maybe once you need to use it, you're going to be like, ah, OK, that makes a little bit more sense. So I have to admit, when it came to this environment, things I can follow what they're saying, but I'm not sure I have a complete understanding of like how important this is. And so I'm hopeful I'm looking forward to chapter seven. Um, I won't worry too much about these exercises. Um, does anyone have any like tricky questions for me about environments? No, uh, good job. Like we're gonna see more letters, but I think like the function being able to see its parents mm -hmm. make it available to see like the variable in the global. For example, like when you call a function from your global environment, yeah. the function creates its local environment. That's obviously you want it to be able to reference the global one. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. But I have, the... Yeah, I have used things like that in shiny apps a little bit where you're trying to do a little bit more meta programming. I think it might come into hand handy with meta programming yeah. too. Yeah. And I think it's one of the core functional programming too, but yeah. Yeah. I also may not in my head have it straight exactly what the difference between functional and meta programming are. Sometimes I think they're the same thing. All right. So the last section is a little wordy. Sorry about that guys. Um, is essentially the idea of unbinding and garbage collection. So, the principal things to take home from this section are that, you know, you have a name, it's bound to an object, but if you delete that name, so if you use RM, you know, X when in our examples, you still have the value, it still exists, we just don't see it, we don't know it's there. Um, but R will automatically get rid of it as needed. So if R needs more memory, it'll, it'll omit it because, or it'll remove it um, because we no longer have a name bound to it. Um, 
I also, I, I had this quote here, looking from the outside is basically impossible to understand when it's going to be run. So you shouldn't even try. I kind of like the statements like that. So I do include them here. Um, but if you do want to know when it's happening, you would use a GC info and you can force a garbage collector to run if you want with GC. And you actually may have seen people talking about it, but you almost never need to do it. You only would ever do it if you actually had another piece of software running on your computer that needed more memory and you were trying to get R to release it. But within R, for our purposes, you don't need to run it unless you're curious to get this little table so that you can see what the outputs are. They're not going to be the same as what your OS tells you. Uh, because it doesn't include all the same things that the OS is looking at. And um, both R and the OS are not going to release memory until it's being asked for by other sort of softwares. All right. I think we have two minutes to spare. <laughs> great, great job. No, the garbage collection in R, like no one, I, I feel like very few people understand it well. Uh, and because it's probably dependent on the OS also, you have like a lot of parameters. Uh, anyway, I don't think like it matters too much um, in a lot of cases. Thanks, Steffi, it was great. And you are perfectly on time. Uh, does anyone have question, remark? Uh, well, like, congrats, Steffi, first. <laughs> Well, sure. great, and, and thanks a lot for the doing like some live codings always awesome yeah no it was really useful it was kind of fun i i don't often get to live code with um like kind of more interesting topics like this yeah or you know at all really but yeah okay i, I did i stop sharing my screen somewhere along there or am no, i still, sharing? still sharing but uh, oh, it's just you like that. all right well i'll see everyone next week yeah it was uh good to get it everyone. You. Have a good Thank week. You. Good weekend. Sorry. Thank Happy you. Friday. Bye. Bye. Oh, oh you want to stop or end?